So uh, last time we were looking essentially at the MM1Q and different parameters of interest of the MM1Q. In, in, uh, in, a, you know, in practical terms, uh, <clears throat> MM1Q is the Swiss Army knife. You, know, you pull it out and you use it. And that's why, you know, as I said, that pretty much everything before this in the course uh, was leading to the MM1Q because that's what you really need to understand. I hope that you know last time we went through it in quite a bit of detail. You understand the MM1Q. Uh, today we're going to sort of just wrap up, you know, the last few topics. And uh, what you're going to do is to look at the analysis we did with MM1 and use the same approach to analyze two different queues: the MM infinity, which is uh, is infinite number of servers. And I'll tell you precisely what that means in just a minute. And then an MM1Q with a bounded number of buffers. Now, this is actually a pretty important practical case because you never have infinite number of buffers. So this equation turns out to be important for sizing. You know, when you decide how many buffers to put, this is what you're going to use. And then two other Qs, which are uh, also relatively important. One is the MD1 in case the service times are not exponentially distributed but are de deterministically distributed. The Q changes its structure because of the MD1. And then the GG1 is the general Q. We have very little to say about it. And then finally, the last part of the uh, of queuing theory really deals with uh, going beyond just one Q. Instead of just having one Q that you're looking at, you're going to start looking at what happens when you put Qs in together. And unfortunately, there's not very much you can say about that either. And you'll see why. So let me write, start with the MM infinity Q. And just to refresh your mind, I'm going to write down the general equilibrium for the uh, for the birth death process. This is really where you always start from uh, for analyzing the Qs. And we have Pj equals uh, P0, pi j equals, sorry, pi equals 0 to j minus 1, lambda i by mu i plus 1. This is your, <coughs> the same old equation we've been using. And then, you know, we know sigma pi equals 1 which means that P0 equals 1 over 1 plus sigma j equals 1 to infinity pi uh, i equals 0 to j minus 1 lambda i by mu i plus 1. These are just equations 29 and 30. So what we need to do now is to essentially figure out what are the values of lambda i and mu i for the MM infinity Q. And if you do that, then we can figure out Pj in terms of P0, and then we can plug lambda and mu i in P0. Notice that this equation, all you really need to do is to, figure, is to determine the values of lambda and mu. Once you know the values of lambda and mu, you can just plug it in, right? So it's really, uh, it's a, you know, it's really a very straightforward approach. So what does it mean to have MM infinity? So here is what's going on. So we have some birth death process and it's an infinite uh, birth death process what does it mean if you have infinite number of servers well let's think about it right let's say that uh, we go into a bank which has an infinite number of customer service representatives so you have an infinite number of them but actually all that matters is there's as many servers as there are customers so when a customer goes in there's always an available queue the rest of them may not actually exist. We don't really care, right? So, so if you have an infinite number of servers, all that means is the number of servers equals number of customers, okay? So if, there are one, if there's one customer in the bank, then the service rate is going to be mu. If there are two customers in the bank, the service rate is going to be two mu. And the three customers in the bank, the three mu. And in general, at the ith stage, you have i mu service. And customer arrivals are Poisson, so the independent of state, so you always have lambda, customer arrivals. Okay, so this is therefore the state transition rate diagram for an infinite server system. Right? It's pretty straightforward. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. This is basically all you're saying is that it doesn't matter how many people, how many servers are actually there. As long as you had three to serve the three customers, I'm all set. So this is the uh, this is the uh, thing. So now we can uh, plug it into here. So let's yeah. So with your explanations, it should go from state two to state zero because there are two servers both 
rules will be served. Yeah. So there will be no one in the queue. Why? When you're serving two people, mm-hmm. one of them is going to finish first, right? So you go to one. And then you're back to one. Infinite service, they can be, they, it can be done simultaneously. They're being served together, but one of them finishes first. So when you have two customers, so the question is, why, why aren't you going from two all the way to zero? Okay? The reason is because when you have two in service, okay, what's going on is that they're both getting service independently. And these are stochastic processes. So one of them is going to finish, the probability that they both finish at the same time is zero. Okay, because that's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a probability. So one of them is going to finish earlier than the other with probability one. Okay, so when you finish, you come here, and then you finish the other one, you come here. So you never actually go to zero. You don't need to worry. That's a zero probability event. Okay. Yes. That's correct. That's exactly right. So we we don't have a queue. We don't have a queue. When you when we, when we compute p zero, you'll find that there is no queue. Everybody's in the system. Right? So everybody is, so remember we have this notion of in the queue and in the system. So everybody's in the system, nobody's in the queue. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> the first time you look at it, it's kind of surprising, like, oh, this looks like a really complicated system, and you draw it and say, oh, that's really easy. You know, it's a letdown because you think infinity is hard, but in this case, one of a few times infinity is not so bad at all. All right, so, well, let's just write down PJ. So pj equals p0, and well, what are we going to do? It's going to be lambda always, okay? And then mu i plus 1 is just uh, uh, i plus 1 mu, right? So p0 uh, pi i equals 0 to uh, j minus 1, lambda by i plus 1 mu, right? I mean... I just wrote down what I said. So from the i plus 1 state, your transition exit is mu i plus 1, uh, i plus 1 mu. And so this is nothing more than p0 uh, lambda by mu uh, to the j, 1 over j factorial. Okay. So uh, if you just expand this out, you'll find that you're just getting a whole bunch of lambda by mu terms, right? J, j terms, which are both, which are all lambda over mu, j times, and then what is this? This is 1 over 1 times 1 over 2 times 1 over 3 times 1 over 4, etc. and this is 1 over j factorial. So you get the j factorial over here, which you can write down as p0 uh, rho to the j by j factorial. Okay? That's just representing lambda over mu equals rho, which is the notation I introduced last time. Then we can write down P0 from the lower equation over there as 1 over 1 plus uh, sigma j equals 1 to infinity uh, rho, sorry, rho to the j uh, by j factorial. Okay? Rho to the j by j factorial. And this over here is a very standard summation. Okay, so anybody know what it is? It's e to the power rho. So this is just e to the rho. That's the standard expansion for, well, one, yeah, standard expansion for, sorry? The whole thing, sorry. I should take it back. One plus. Yeah. Okay? So this means that P0 is nothing more than e to the minus rho. Okay, we just we just got that for free. Again, the infinite... Uh, summation, you know, in this case works out nicely. So we have that, which means that we can go back over here and we can say that pj is e to the minus rho, rho to the j, the j factorial. And that gives us the closed form solution for the probability of being in the state j. Okay? Now, if you look at it, you say, oh, wait a minute, this looks familiar because this is just e to the minus rho, rho to the j, the j factorial, but now you should recognize that what, what distribution is that? It's a Poisson distribution, right? So this is Poisson. So the number of people in the queue that we expect to have is distributed according to Poisson, okay? So the uh, number of people in the system, I should say, is going to be Poisson. So we're going to essentially have some kind of uh, curve like that, 
Uh, okay. Uh, it's not exponential, but it's Poisson, but you know, it goes down pretty fast. At any rate, uh, what is the parameter of the Poisson? Okay, so the expected value of, uh, of the uh, number of customers, n number in system, is just the Poisson parameter, which is rho. Okay, because we know that the expected value of Poisson distribution is the, so, I mean, Basically, J is the number in the system because J is the, it's a birth death process. The state is just the number in the system, okay? So all, we have that. So the number, the, need, the number in the system we can get simply by looking at the distribution of this and the mean is rho. So this immediately tells us that the expected number is rho, but rho is less than one, right? Rho is less than one, lambda is less than mu for stability. And because rho is less than one, uh, so I take it back. Uh, yeah, rho, rho in this case is not necessarily less than one because the service rate is uh, is going to be uh, uh, increasing each time. So we don't have rho less than. But at any rate, the expected number in the system is going to be rho. We can have uh, lambda greater than mu in this in this system because the uh, we don't actually have a fixed service rate. We have a variable service rate. So. I should take that back, okay? But the point still remains that the expected number in the system is, is, just, is just this value over here, okay? Uh, any questions over here so far? So what I've done is to start with the general equilibrium process, which is the is, is, uh, straightforward thing. We, so this is, this, is the, this is what you always do. You start with the birth death process over here, annotated with the appropriate rates. When you have that, then you can just plug in the values to get pj and uh, p0. And once you have pj and p0, we can now look at the uh, distribution. Now we can start computing expected waiting time, the uh, expected number of customers, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, all that just falls. Mean number in system, all that just comes right out of, out of this, uh, these equations over here. So let me do an example just to uh, kind of set these things down. Uh, so imagine that you have a bank which has, uh, you know, so some of these, uh, you know, private banks, you go in and there's a customer service agent for you, right? That's why it's a private bank. You'll be very wealthy, but there's always somebody waiting for you. So we have an infinite service situation. So we have, uh, let's say customers arrive at Poisson rate. Uh, okay, at uh, Poisson rate. Uh, And uh, we say that they have uh, the 10 customers per hour. And we assume that the service rate, uh, service times, I should say, are exponentially distributed. And the mean is 20 minutes. It takes about 20 minutes to serve every customer. And uh, I want to find out What's the probability there are uh, five customers in the bank? Okay. So uh, customers arrived at Poisson process, 10 customers an hour, so lambda equals 10. Okay. The service time is 20 minutes. We have service rate is three customers an hour, so mu equals three. So you can see that actually Lambda is greater than mu, but that's not a problem because a mu actually is variable. Mu is just telling you the service time for one customer. Okay, so it's not a problem. And so we get that uh, rho, uh, okay, so I guess rho equals 10 over 3, and then P0 equals e to the minus 10 over 3, okay, and P5 equals e to the minus 10 over 3 times uh, uh, 10 over 3 to the power 5 or times 1 over 5 factorial. And this number turns out to be, if my calculation is correct, 0.123 or roughly you know, 12 percent, you know, one, 1 in 8 chance. So about five customers in the bank is 1 in 8 chance. All five customers are being served. Nobody is actually in a queue. They're all getting served 
But you know, we, f we find that with this arrival rate and this service rate, we have about five people being served at any point in time. So if you're a bank, a uh, private bank, and you want to have one service person per customer, we know that if customers arrive at a rate of 10 an hour, and it takes about 20 minutes to serve each of them, then we should have, you know, there's a 12% chance there are going to be five people. We can actually compute this out, you know, P P5, P7, P10, whatever, and let's say we want to get to service, we want to guarantee that 99% of the time you will never have to wait. Okay, 99% of the time there'll be somebody in the somebody ready to help you. That will allow you to compute. So you do P5, P6, P7. At some point we go go below 0.01. At the point where we go below 0.01, we say, okay, that's the number of people I need to keep, and you know, then there, I don't need to have infinite number of servers. I just need to have more than a certain number. So it will be a non-zero probability mass on somebody having to wait, but, you know, we're giving you 99.99% guarantee. This kind of computation is at the heart of service level agreements, okay? So when you go and uh, go to a data center or you go to a web, web hosting or any of these things, they give you a service level agreement. They say, okay, 99% of the time we guarantee something, okay? But how can they do it? What they've done is they've got some model on the arrival rate, they've got some model on the service time, and then they run through this, and they say, okay, if we allocate so many resources, chances are pretty good that we're not going to be in trouble, okay? So, uh, I'll, well, we should probably, well, it's not too early for, okay. I should probably just mention that uh, these kinds of guarantees are critically dependent on the assumptions that are being made over here. The assumptions that the customers arrive as a Poisson process, the assumption that service stands exponentially distributed. If, for example, customers don't arrive as a Poisson process, a whole bunch show up at the same time and say, give me service, then all the sizing is going to be off, okay? There is a popular term that is floating around for this called the black swan effect. How many of you have heard of this thing, the black swan effect? No, that's different. The Black Swan Effect is a book that came out last year or two years ago by an economist. It's a popular book, and it's being pulled out as an explanation for the financial crisis that's going on. And the, uh, uh, the, the claim is that the financial... Uh, okay, Black Swan. So what is a Black Swan? Until people went to Australia, they, they th imagined Black Swans were impossible. Okay, so it was, you know, they, they said there's no way a swan could be black. And uh, so... You know, uh, uh, there is a Latin phrase which said, as rare as a black swan, as it, you know, basically it's not going to happen. Well, they went to Australia and all the swans are black. <laughs> so what happens when reality does not match your models, okay? Then the, the, the claim is that, uh, well, you don't know what to do, okay? Certainly that's the case with uh, the leadership at this point. For the most part, they're saying, oh, we don't know what to do. It's a black swan. So it's a great excuse, okay? <laughs> what I'm saying over here is that the sizing that's being done over here with the MM1 infin uh, MM infinity model makes fairly strong assumptions, okay? So there's the same kind of assumptions that are being made by the hedge fund managers and the derivatives people saying, okay, we assume that the stock price is a random Brownian motion. We assume that people are rational. We assume this, we assume that. We plug it away and you say, great, this is a risk-free investment. Okay, this is a completely hedged instrument, risk-free investment. Well, guess what? <laughs> Customers do not follow a Poisson process. They're not rational, okay? And, and therefore, you get these nice numbers, but they don't mean anything. So you have to be careful, okay? You have to be careful to make sure that there's enough margin of error. So you say, okay, MN1, MN Infinity says uh, I should have 10 customer service reps. You get, you know, 20, okay? It's going to cost you something, but then you have, you're, you're hedging yourself against any possible problems. Of course, it comes at a cost. You have to kind of make this trade-off, and that's essentially uh, there are no there's no math there. Okay, you just say, well, you can do some Bayesian expectations and things like that. But it's it, at the end, it's a subjective decision that says, what risk am I willing to pay? Uh, what risk am I willing to take in order to reduce my costs? Okay, and and uh, same kind of thing, by the way, also happens to uh, uh, same kind of equation is used for uh, the uh, 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 call centers. You know, somebody says. You call the phone, they always say the same thing. Due to unexpectedly large call volumes, you have to wait in line. Give me a break, okay? They're always unexpectedly large. <laughs> I've never had a thing saying, due to unexpectedly small call volumes, we're going to answer your call right away. It never happens. It's always unexpectedly large. So anyway, so let me 
tell you the story with that using this example, which is the MM1K, because that actually is even more relevant to this than an infinite uh, server queue. So, so in the infinite server case, we actually have lots and lots of service representatives. But uh, MM1K is a slightly different problem. MM1K says, I have a single server, but I have K buffers only. After K buffers, calls are lost. So this is more like a call center. Okay, it's more like a call center. So how do we draw this? Well, it turns out, again, to be pretty straightforward. So we have our state 0, 1, 2, etc. And we come to state k. What happens is we have arrivals at lambda, at rate lambda into k, and departures uh, at, uh, uh, into out of k at rate mu. But we have no arri arri all arrivals out of k are considered to be lost. Okay, so if you have if you're in state k, that means your queue is full. If you have any arrivals, we actually have you know we just say lambda equals zero. Okay, for all lambda j equals zero for all j greater than equal to k. Okay, so so that's the way we denote that, and now we can try and analyze what the system is going to do, okay, because this gives us the, so the, we can think of this as being the case of a single worker in a call center, and they get calls, calls are queued up, and when they get too many calls, they just go away. Alternatively, uh, think of uh, the uh, web server, right? If you know if there's a socket call, and when you do a listen on a socket, you have a number like five, which is the size of the queue, socket queue, right? So if this is the number of pending connections. You can do five, you know, you can do, sorry, you do a socket, listen. Okay, you're listening on a socket, and you say, okay, I'm going to have five pending connections. You do accept, 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 and you're accepting all those calls, but you can have a queue of up to five. Five is the default value for the listen call in BSD and most implementations. So that's exactly like this. You can have up to five people. If somebody tries to connect to you, okay, uh, to a web server, and the listen queue is full, you basically drop that thing. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't accept it. Okay, you say, well, uh, so your connection does not is not accepted. TCP will drop it. Okay, so <clears throat> that is a very common case. Okay, so what we want to do is to analyze the system. So how do we analyze it? We use the same exact techniques over here. All right. So let's just go and do that. So we can write down the following. So lambda j equals 0. So lambda j equals lambda for j less than k. And lambda j equals 0 for j greater than or equal to k. That's the same thing that I drew over there. And mu j equals mu for j equals 1, 2, etc. until k. And then beyond k, it's undefined. We don't really care what mu is beyond uh, k because you know we never enter the state. If lambda is zero, we're never going to enter that state. So immediately we can start uh, plugging these values into this one over here, and we get the following: p j equals p zero lambda by mu uh, to the j for j less than or equal to k and wrong place. Zero for j greater than k. But obviously, I'm, going to, I'm not going to be in state k. Uh, any, k is any state greater than k, so obviously pj equals zero for j greater than or equal to k. So I get that. And then for p0, I have to substitute value of pj. So p0 equals 1 over 1 plus sigma j equals 1 to k. We don't have the infinite sum anymore. It's a finite sum. Uh, uh, lambda by mu to the power j. Okay, that's a pretty straight, because the, we don't, you know, we, the, we've got pj as a nice close form right away, because we, you know, the, the, the product over here is just lambda by mu to the power j. And then we can, we know the following standard result if R is less than 1, uh, sigma uh, k equals 0 to 
n minus 1 r to the k equals 1 minus r to the n by 1 minus r, okay. So this is a standard result. You can prove it in any number of ways, but basically gives you the, there's not infinite sum, there's a finite sum. I have uh, uh, n terms, k equals 0 to n minus 1, r to the k. So it's the same telling you the, the summation of a series which has n terms with the uh, geometric series with product r, r is less than 1, it's 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. So if we plug that over here, we get that uh, P0 equals uh, 1 minus rho over 1 minus rho to the power k plus 1, okay? And, and of course, that means right away that Pj equals 1 minus rho over 1 minus rho uh, to the power k plus 1 times rho to the j, j is uh, less than or equal to k or 0 for j greater than k. Okay, this is just plugging it in over here, okay? So uh, what we have over here really is that uh, we are able to find out, you know, as a closed form, again, the probability of being in any particular state, j, okay? and Again, if you know the probability of being in any particular state, we can use that in order to uh, compute all the parameters of interest, the mean waiting time, the mean number of customers in the queue, the mean number of customers in the system, and all these other things uh, we can get over here. In particular, the one thing that we look for is PK, the probability of being in the state K, because the probability of being in state K can be viewed as something called the blocking probability. Okay, if you're in state K, we're going to lose all incoming calls, right? All incoming arrivals are going to be lost. So probability of being state K becomes something that we really do care about. And in particular, we care about it in a different context when the Q is zero. If you have, nobody's allowed, if you have to stay here, uh, and you can go to, you know, basically, if you're in zero, so you can be in one, but you have nothing allowed over here. So basically, K equals one. So P1 for us becomes also an important thing that we'd like to find out. Because uh, if you don't allow any queuing, if you do, if in your listen call you say, okay, I'm not going to allow anybody to queue up, what what happens? Okay, so uh, uh, so if, in gen general, PK becomes a sizing parameter. Okay, How, what size uh, queue should we have in order to uh, not have any losses? So and realize I'm really running out of time a little bit, so I'll just take a break here, and after the break, I will you know use these these equations over here to compute sort of sizing for a, for a buffer, for a, for a web server, for example. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, this is again what I have over here. So let's say that we have a, a system. Uh, this is the same system we had earlier, which was a link with one and a half megabits per second and packets were arriving at some rate, I don't remember. The only thing that's important about it is that rho is equal to 0.8, okay? That's all we really care about. Everything else is actually not important because uh, as we saw, all systems, all MM1 systems which have the same uh, rho are equivalent. So we don't really care what the actual parameters are. All we care about is rho equals 0.8. And we say that we have four buffers, let's say, if four, there are four buffers, then what is K? Okay, what is K for the system? K is five, right? Because you have one in the system, so, okay. And what I want to find out PJ, sorry, I want to find out P3. What is the probability that, uh, whatever, so three of these are in use. I want to find out, let me just write it down because it's easier. So I want to say, what is the probability three buffers are in use. This is nothing more than P4, okay? Because we, all, we have one, in, one, in the, one being served. So, uh, well, K equals five, we want to fit P4. So from this, I'll, I'll just write down the values, I guess, for this. So first, let's just do this. Uh, P0, 
equals 1 minus 0 0.8 that is 1 minus rho uh, over 1 minus 0 0.8 to the power 6 because k plus 1 is 6 okay. So this is just over here right p0 is 1 minus rho over 1 minus rho to the power k plus 1 k is 5 so this is this and so we get p0 equals um, sorry point uh, point two seven, yeah, zero point two seven. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that this is the only Q for which P zero not equal one minus rho. Okay, and I think I mentioned this briefly last time, last lecture as well. In all queuing systems, P zero equals one minus rho. There's a prob that is the pos probability of having nothing in the Q is one minus utilization. In this case, it's not the case because we have losses happening at the far end, at the right end. When you state k, we're going to have losses. So the actual lambda is not the same, so it gets a bit messy, and we don't have this, in, we don't have this anymore. And we can see this. P0 is 0 0.27, and 1 minus 0 0.8 equals 0.2. So obviously, it's not the same, right? So you should see that right away. In fact, what you're seeing over here is that the probability of being in state 0 is a little bit higher than it should be. Again, this is because our arrival rates are kind of thinned out. We're losing some guys at the end of the queue. So lambda is lower than it should be. And we can, if you want, you can kind of think of this virtual lambda being whatever you get from this, okay, so instead of the actual value. Anyway, that's just a comment on the side. So what about P4? I'm not going to go through the math uh, here. But basically, P4, we get, well, I'm going to do that. It's 0 0.27 uh, times uh, 0 0.8 to the 4. This turns out to be 0.11. Again, 0 0.27 is P0. 0 0.8 to the 4 we get simply by um, this one over here. Okay, this is P0, and that's just rho to the j. So we get 0 0.8 to the 4, and that's 0 0.11. And so we're saying that in the probability that uh, we have three buffers are in use is about 10 percent. Okay, and we can now look at the following thing, we want to find out what is the K such that uh, blocking probability is less than 10 to the minus 6. Okay, so we want to say 1 in a million chance that we're not going to have any losses. Okay, we're not going to exit the system. So what K should we have? Well, what we're going to do is basically solve for uh, PK equals 10 to the minus 6. Okay, in that equation over here. Okay, for PK or PJ equals 10 to the minus 6. So we basically say something like this. We say PK equals P0, okay, rho to the J, rho to the K, okay, equals 10 to the minus 6. So what should K be? And it's basically just inverting that equation over there. And we get that K should be equal to 56.04, which means basically we need... Uh, 50, uh, we, okay, so this gives us this, so K, to be smaller than this, K should be equal to 57, okay, or 56 buffers. Okay, so assuming the calculations are correct, which I hope is the case, uh, we need 56 buffers, okay, so because they're like 10% probability of having three and you know, our uh, arrival rate is fairly high. Okay, it's it's uh, eighty percent. So we need fifty-six buffers to make sure that we have a loss rate less than ten to the minus six. As, as I said, assuming the math is correct, uh, I have to go double check it, or somebody's double checked it. That would be anyway. But uh, it doesn't matter whether the math is correct or not. In this, what really matters is we can do this. We can take any value that we want, like ten to the minus six or ten to the minus ten or whatever number we want. And if arrivals are Poisson and services are exponentially distributed and we have finite size Q, we can compute precisely how many buffers we need. And this equation therefore becomes the key equation for provisioning. Okay, so again, we go back to a system where somebody says, okay, I need a web server. I want to guarantee that our connections are going to be accepted. Okay, so somebody goes to a website. It's okay for them to be delayed, but we don't want to get this message saying a connection failed, connection refused. What do we do? What should be the size of the parameter in the listen call to guarantee that only one in a million hits are going to be turned away? Okay, so again, 
we pull out our Swiss Army knife, the MM1Q, in this case MM1KQ, and we say, okay, let's assume that we can model with MM1Q, and now we're going to assume that the arrivals are going to be Poisson, okay? In the web, actually, Poisson arrivals may not be too bad approximation. Why? Because we have an infinite population size, essentially, nearly infinite population size, so the arrival rate ought to be independent of how many people are already there. Now, of course, this is ignoring the slashed out effect, right? So if somebody goes and slashed out, it gets famous in some fashion. Now the arrival rates are far greater than what you think, you know. And, and uh, in fact, they may all come at the same time. They all come at 9 a.m., everybody sees the thing, boom, they go hither. So, so, or whenever they get posted. So, so we can't take that into account, but in the, by and large, ignoring these kinds of flash crowds, as they're called, we can assume the Poisson, and then we can know the service time because we can measure it. We know how long each request takes. You know, typically, in today's websites, when the request comes in, we have a three-tier model. We have a business sort of logic section, and then we have the database thing. So we come in, we say how long it takes, and we can get a distribution of the service times, and we can assume it's exponentially distributed. We get the mean, and then we have mu. So we know lambda, we know mu, we can plug it into an MM1K equation, and that tells you how many you want to have. So this is sort of a performance analysis or system design or system configuration with a certain amount of you know, mathematical uh, basis behind it. Instead of just saying, well, you know, let's try except of 10, and if that doesn't work, let's try 20, and let's try 30. I mean, it's not completely uh, off the mark. Of course, we have made some assumptions here. So I'm just trying to get you the message that <coughs> the math here is not solving everything, but it's giving you uh, 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 a basis on which you can at least start thinking about what am I looking for? What are the things I need to measure? I need to measure lambda and nu. How do I do that? Rather than saying, well, you know, let's just try doing this. So the, the uh, uh, typical computer science approach is this. It's a kitchen sink, a kitchen recipe approach, okay? It's too salty. Let me put some more something else, you know? It's not too salty. Let me put some salt. You keep mixing it up, mixing it up. In the end, hopefully it tastes good. This is how people write code. Okay, this is how you write code. Uh, what about this parameter? I don't know what it is. I'll just make it into a parameter and let the user do, figure it out. Okay. Give me a break. <laughs> okay. No user knows what parameter to set for the accept call, okay, the listen call. It's not going to happen. Right? So the basis, and this is you know, the mathematical basis of computer networking, the whole premise of this course is if you know some math, you can do something that's not stupid. Okay? Okay, possibly. Okay. Being stupid is easy, okay? At least now you made some effort and you cannot be intelligently stupid, okay? In the sense that you're making some reasonable assumptions and you have some reasonable output that you expect and you could be wrong, but you know why you went wrong. You went wrong because arrivals did not follow Poisson or service times were not exponentially distributed, etc. right? It won't be that, well, you know, I set the parameter to five and, ah, sorry, it didn't work, okay? So this is, this is, this is uh, hopefully going to help you, you know, do something realistic and uh, mathematically well-founded. Anyway, so that's my, uh, that's my uh, whatever, sermon for mathematical foundations. Uh, any questions about this? Oh, yes? In Q for calculating P, A, yeah. actually for calculating K, K, have you used numerical methods or an analytical method? Because we have rho to the power of k plus 1 and rho to the power of k. Yeah. And some This one. I just took the logarithms on both sides. <laughs> oh, where, where P0 is constant, right? This is equal to 0.27. No, P0 change it. Oh, I see. A function of oh, that's right. What am I doing over here? Yeah, no wonder it looks wrong. It is wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, I should have been using newton raphson iteration, which I did not. I just uh, assumed that P0 is constant, which of course was wrong. Okay, so just scratch that example. <laughs> you can solve it. It's not a big deal to solve it using any number of, uh, you know, they can use newton raphson iteration or anything you want. I'd better go fix this example. Yeah. I did this in a hurry, and I looked at it, it said 56 is wrong. I don't get it. Why is it 56? It looks too high. Now I know why it's wrong. <laughs> okay, thank you. So yes, P0 itself changes. Doesn't matter. We have an equation, and we can we can plug it into any number of solvers to do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in this system, a row can be greater than one, right? 
Uh, row can be greater than one, correct? Uh, let me see. Can, uh, uh, let me see. This oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, can row be greater than one? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, see, the meaning of row here is kind of funny. Okay, we don't actually. You cannot think of row as being utilization. We have lambda. We have mu. Okay, I'm writing rho in this sense merely as shorthand for lambda over mu. But it is incorrect to think that rho is the arrival rate, okay? Because we have departures at the end also. We have departures in two ways. We get service or you arrive to a full skew. So it's not correct to think about it. You should basically be using lambda and mu. Is, that, is it possible that lambda be greater than mu? Can lambda be, so uh, if lambda is greater than mu, so let me see. Uh, Sorry? If, if row is greater than one, yeah. probability does not define. Yeah, the, the, no, that's right. I mean, I'm just saying that lambda and mu are well defined, right? It's just a question of is rho the utilization? The rho is not the utilization. That's all I'm saying. Can lambda be greater than mu? Lambda can be greater than mu, right? Yeah, lambda can be greater than mu. Yes. Can. Uh, those formulas does work, so. This formula doesn't work. It works? Yeah, it should work. Yeah, it does work. Yeah. Uh, so when rho is less than one, then that spirit from one to one, which is r. Oh, sorry, that's right. If if, uh, if we need to have a lambda less than mu for. Uh, yeah, we have to change it uh, other way around. But I mean, this particular uh, formula I've used over here assumes that we're using uh, r is if lambda is less than mu. If you change it, then we have to use a different. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, it's it's okay. Believe me. <laughs> I'm just giving you the uh, formula for the summation when uh, it is less than one. If it's greater than one, the formula changes, and we plug that in instead. It's not for this one. Is it? Uh, uh, oh, I see. Because they're both going to be negative if uh, mu is greater than. Uh, okay. Let me put it like this. I'm sure of this when R is less than one. Let me check into it uh, for uh, what is the summation for. Uh, Greater than mu. I, I, let me get it. Let me check check into it and get back. I don't want to solve it in real time either. Okay. Okay. I uh, I don't remember the series well enough to to say what the exact <laughs> what it is. Okay. Uh, let me see. I want to just move on to the MD one Q over here. And so when you have the MD1Q, we hit the first problem, which is that uh, departures are not uh, Poisson. Arrivals are Poisson, departures are not Poisson. Okay? So we can't actually write it in a, in a birth that. Uh, notation because in, a, uh, in, the, in, the, in this notation, we, we assume that these rates over here, this mu over here is a, a, a constant uh, departure rate, okay? And that it's uh, exponentially distributed times. Here with the times, the inter-departure times are, are deterministic. So the analysis gets a bit more complicated and what is important really is the, are the results of the analysis. And, uh, I don't know. Okay, so let me just write it down. So we can find out pj. It turns out to be 1 minus rho for j equals 0. So p0 is 1 minus rho. Well, we knew that already. It's 1 minus rho e to the rho minus 1 for j equals 1. And then for j greater than 1, it's this complicated expression that I'm not going to write down. It's in the notes. It's a mess. 
<laughs> okay. And the, the, but the nice thing is when we can do this, we can say mean number in system This turns out to be rho plus rho square over 2 times 1 minus rho. Okay, and let me just get, and then the mean response time. Mean response time for 1 over mu plus. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, that's correct. So first of all, uh, the thing to note over here is that both of these mean number and system and the mean response time essentially go to infinity as rho goes to one. Okay, this is characteristic of any unbounded system. Okay, it means you don't have bound. In the infinite server case, we had lots of servers, so we never had this problem. And in the uh, bounded buffer case, again, we had losses going off. So either in one case, the arrivals are getting throttled or in the infinite server case, the departures are getting speeded up, okay? But when, when those things happen, then things are different. But when you have a regular system, like an MD1 system, we've had the one minus row term. So basically for all queuing systems, there is going to be one minus row in the denominator for the mean number in system and mean response time. Because as the as approach 100% utilization, you are going to shoot through the roof in terms of this. So no matter what your queuing system is, you should have the utilization not be too close to one, which is why the MM1 is a reasonable approximation because we have a system where uh, we have the similar one over one minus row type dependency, so uh, we can uh, use it as a sort of first approximation to sizing. So that's, what, that's one thing I wanted to point out over here. The second thing is that as the load gets pretty heavy, as, as rho tends to uh, one, what we can do is we can find, and this is a homework exercise, that the uh, mean number in the system and the response time for MD1 is actually half of what it is with MM1. Okay, so we're getting something for determinism. Under heavy load, okay, you'll find that the mean response time is half of what it is with MM1, and uh, that sort of is a gain from determinism, and actually you should probably try and prove it. Uh, that's one of the homework uh, questions in, the, in this chapter. Okay, uh, any, any so basically that's all I wanted to say about MD1. Uh, the analysis is more complicated than, than you would think. Uh, and uh, actually, you know, you have to go back to first principles and try and analyze it. Uh, and I will not go through over here. Uh, okay, any questions about that? Okay, so just some results. And then finally, I have a simple result to tell you about with this GG1. <laughs> And there's even less to say about GG1 than MM1, uh, MD1. So for general arrivals and general service, we only know basically two things about it. First thing we know is Little's Law. And the second thing we know about it is that uh, P0 equals 1 minus rho if you have unbounded number of buffers. Okay. After that, everything else really depends on what the system looks like. And many different approaches have been used. So, you know, again, this course is just giving you like a taste of what queuing theory is. So if you are interested in it, you can go look up, you know, Klein Rock or any number of other books, which will give you much more information on GG1, but then you sort of have to really get into queuing theory. And uh, two problems. One is the number of techniques you need to learn are fairly large. And the second problem is that in real life, we really cannot characterize anything that well. Okay? We, we don't have the uh, stationarity of the, of the system. But what I mean, that, mean by that is that we rarely have a situation where the load stays constant for long enough for us to say this is lambda. Okay? We don't have it. Right? We, uh, uh, you know, the loads in, a system, in any network today are always fluctuating. Okay, if you take the load on this campus, the amount of number of packets going through the system in this campus, well, between midnight or maybe between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m., basically nothing is going on. Everything is idle for the most part. Okay, around between 8, sort of traffic picks up, reaches a peak, and then goes down, and then goes up again in the evening, perhaps, you know, when people are doing their homework assignments, and it goes down again. 
So this kind of pattern is very, very common. So what is lambda? Okay, we don't actually have any particular lambda. We have for each point in time, we have some lambda. And I said, okay, let's use a busy R and let's size it based on a busy R. But even there, it gets pretty problematic because we don't actually know that uh, any particular th a day is representative. Okay, let's say I take today, right now, I said this is the busy hour, is 2 to 3 p.m. Well, maybe a homework assignment is due tomorrow, and a lot of people are going off and trying to do something. Okay, they're trying to look up some information. Maybe the load increases. Maybe today is actually a holiday, you know, so nobody's there. So finding what is, constitutes a representative sample, a re representative hour, uh, is actually impossible. So we can spend a lot of time coming up with these models, and then at the end of it, what we find is that I can't even put in the first thing, which is what is the arrival rate, because it changes, okay? I'm looking at arrival rates over one second, or five seconds, one minute, one hour, one day, then which day? Is it a weekend or a weekday? If it's a weekday, is it a weekday that's not a holiday? <laughs> and you can see it gets quite messy. So the, the bottom line is that you have to be familiar with the math, but you also have to be familiar with where it doesn't work, okay? So the goal here is to show you some of the ideas that are useful, and MM1, from my, from my perspective, MM1 is just the right level, where it's, you know, as I said, if you're going to be wrong, you must be spending, you shouldn't spend too much time being wrong. So MM1 is simple enough, you can just apply it, and you say, look, I know it's wrong, but it's, you know, it gives me just enough. Once you go into GG1, you're basically doing math, and the applicability of this math to real queuing systems is, is doubtful. Okay, at least in my mind, it's pretty doubtful. Okay, so I'm going to uh, pretty much stop with that. And let's see, okay, let me take a short break and then I'll come back to the last topic and we'll probably end early because there's not a whole lot to say about this either. <laughs> so I can go back to doing my queuing theory. Okay. So queuing theory you've studied so far is all a big joke, <laughs> okay? Now I can tell you. It's a big joke in the following sense. Essentially, all queues in, in networks are, are, are linked to other queues, right? So we have a router, and the router talks to another router, and it goes like this, et cetera. And, you know, we always draw networks like this. But, okay, so let's say even that stuff comes in here as Poisson. All right, that's fine. Now, uh, let's take, okay, okay, so let's assume that this is exponential service, okay? So it's an MM1Q, for example. So the nice thing is the departure processor MM1Q is Poisson. So that's great. I'm going to have Poisson over here, and, you know, I'm going to have Poisson over here as well because uh, assuming I can split a stream, it can be shown that if you split a stream, you know, basically you get Poisson as well. Now, we're going to have to merge these two guys. So the input to this queue over here is the input of two Poisson streams, and it turns out that that is Poisson as well, and so we get Poisson here. So in summary, if we are going to have a queue where everything flows in this direction like this, Okay, and we kind of have no exits, everything goes out the output like that. Then we have essentially what's called a tandem queue system. Okay, your queue followed by queue followed by queue. And if all the inputs are Poisson like this, and maybe if you have an input over here that's Poisson, then it's relatively easy to show that everything that feeds through over here is all going to be Poisson all the way through, and life is easy, you know. So the the, the, the arrival rate over here is equivalent to the sum of the arrival rates. And then similarly, you can define, you know, it's a little bit more work. We can define how to split things up, but it's not particularly hard. So we can do that, okay? So that works out. So this part is easy, okay? Now, what we want to worry about is a second thing, which is what happens if people exit from anywhere or they can join from anywhere? Or worse, we have some people leaving the queue over here and then coming back over here. Okay, so we have something coming here, leaves, and then you have a loop back and comes back over here. Now, in networks, it shouldn't be happening, but
But this could be happening in a bank. You know, you, you go to first teller, they say do something. You go to second teller and they say, okay, you have to go back to the first teller, so you go back to the first teller. When you have this kind of network, then we don't have this feed through. We don't have a tandem queue situation anymore, okay? Then uh, we have this very nice result by Jackson, which says that if all the inputs are Poisson, all the servers are exponentially, uh, have exponentially distributed service times, then this queue over here, even though it has a feedback loop, acts as if it's being fed by a Poisson stream, okay? So the loops, uh, basically what it says, loops don't matter. Ar arrivals and departures like that also don't matter. Everything, if, if all the inputs are Poisson or the exponential, then we have a, what's called a Jacksonian network, okay? And this is a very fundamental result in networks of queues. And basically it's the main result we have. And it, uh, it, in particular, we can say the following thing. We say that uh, even if we have, okay, so we even allow M servers in each of them. So these are MMM queues. So even if they're MMM queues, it still works. Even if you have loops, it still works. We def let P, K1, K2, Kn, okay? It, this is, means that this is probability of K1 customers in Q1, in uh, server one, K2 customers in server two, etc. So in other words, I have these guys sitting over here in these queues in each of these servers, and I want to find out the probability, okay, the joint probability distribution of having these many customers. For example, I want to know what is the probability that there's one customer here, three customers here, two customers here, two customers here, six here, whatever, five here. So I want to know that joint probability distribution. What Jackson showed was that this distribution, which looks pretty complicated, turns out to be something very easy called the product form. It's nothing more than probability K1 multiplied by probability K2 multiplied by probability K3, etc. That means we can analyze each Q independently, and these PK1, P2, this is nothing more than the PJ we saw earlier for Markov Q, for the, uh, for the, for the uh, Markov system. Okay, so if this is network is Jacksonian, all Poisson, all exponential, then each Q, the, uh, the, the, the uh, probability that a Q has a certain number of elements in it is going to be uh, uh, a product form, and then we can just look at the overall system. And this is what's called a product form solution. And this is the key into understanding networks of queues. Okay. So that's great. That's a very big achievement. On the other hand, it's also not great because if any of these assumptions is wrong, we get into trouble. Okay. For example, if any of these inputs is not Poisson, or any of the, any of the servers is not an exponential server, we really cannot say very much about the structure of the network, and the product forms don't necessarily hold. Okay. And of course, when you look at actual networks, we have this intrinsic problem of we don't even know what the rates are, but even if the rates are there, we know for, for a fact through measurements that the arrivals are definitely not Poisson. Okay, and services certainly are not exponentially distributed. So in real networks, we really don't have a whole lot going on, very much analysis that's possible. And so there has been some recent attempts to do, to, to, to do to, uh, what's called network calculus. And the basic idea over here is to characterize each, uh, each of these queues not by the, uh, you know, as a Markov process, but by what's called the service rate curve, a service curve, okay? And a service curve uh, basically says that uh, if my inputs look like this, how am I going to serve the, uh, serve the input? So on the x-axis you have time, on the y-axis you have essentially arrivals and departures. And so it says arrivals, each arrival can see, you know, basically is the number of bits. 
So each arrival pushes the number of bits higher and higher. The service curve it tells you how you're going to service this, right? The departure. And so if you characterize each queue in the form of these service curves, then it's possible to compose these service curves together, and there's this whole calculus for doing that. And more recently, like in the last two years, uh, some people at uh, University of Toronto have come up with something called stochastic network calculus, which makes it possible to analyze stochastic behavior. This is deterministic, but they can do stochastic. The math is very complicated, <laughs> and I don't understand it. Uh, it's not clear how much you can do, but at least it goes beyond product form solutions. So if you're interested, you, know, you should look into network calculus, calculus and uh, stochastic network calculus for, for kind of uh, more information on this. Okay, so I want to take just a minute or two to kind of summarize this. Are there any questions about this over here? Because that's all I wanted to say about networks of queues. Okay, yes. These are routers, yeah. I think uh, the, the, uh, the arrival of packets depends on the network layer. Yes. Or routing, and uh, sometimes traffic goes through a path, uh, depends on the path. And yes. So, so. What is it you don't agree with? <laughs> How can it be Poisson all over the. Uh, How can it be Poisson? It's not. <laughs> it's not. That's why I said. The Jacksonian, all we can analyze is a very, very simple case of Poisson arrivals. In reality, we are very far from it in, in two different ways. One is it's not Poisson, and second, even if it's Poisson, we don't even know what rate to give it because the rates are time dependent, right? We don't have any kind of specific arrival rate per se that says customers coming at 10 customers per hour. It depends. If it's 2 in the morning, it's different from 2 in the afternoon. So in two very fundamental levels, we really don't know what's going on, okay? So that's why you know these networks of queues and stochastic calculus and so on are are you know of mostly a theoretical interest. Oops. Any other questions about this? Okay, I realize this is on video, so these guys in Toronto are going to beat me up, but that's okay. It's a friend of mine, you know. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so I just wanted to give a summary of you know where the. Uh, uh, where I think the uh, queuing theory fits in. Uh, just to repeat a couple of points. So we started out by saying, what's a stochastic process, okay, and understand what a stochastic process is. I think that's fundamental, okay. You really need to understand uh, probability and stochastic processes because it gives you the ability to think about uh, uh, the, uh, how things behave over time, you know, and to characterize them. Uh, the... Uh, Markov chain idea and the notion of things, you know, being simple. If you if you restrict the stochastic process, again, it's a very important thing. Okay, and the whole Markov analysis shows up not just here, but hopefully any of you working in AI where you have Markov processes or decision theory or uh, many number many many other places will use Markov analysis at one point or the other. For example, if you're doing speech recognition, uh, it turns out that it's actually a very it's a very it's a very important uh, Markov. Uh, uh, analysis that goes on over there. Okay, uh, going into birth death processes, these are sort of more relevant to networking uh, and uh, to some extent epidemiology. So that's interesting as well. But then once we start getting out of single queues into multiple queues, I think the power of queuing theory goes uh, becomes less and less. And so the MM1 queue to me represents sort of the high point. Okay, so what I'd, if you if you forget everything about this course. At least you should remember what the MM1Q does because that is going to be something that you'll use hopefully over and over again. Okay, so that's basically all I had to say uh, to to summarize this uh, what you've seen so far, and uh, hopefully the an, the analysis techniques over here are something that you can use in other queuing systems. And you have enough here, I think, that if you take any paper on queuing theory, you're not going to be totally lost. Okay, you have some idea what's going on, and you should be able to follow through, which is the, which is the goal. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, great. We will end here then. And we'll start with game theory next week. <laughs>